recorded in the book of Luke in chapter 6 at verse 46. The word Lord means ruler. It means sovereign. And I think we may understand that in the common vernacular games, they know that the Lord is the one who is in charge. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, remember, in writing to them about meats being offered to idols, they had questions. And Paul wrote to them, and he said, you know, we know an idol is nothing, really. But even though they are lords, and even though they're gods, yet for us there is only one God. He's the Father. And there's only one Lord, and he's Jesus Christ. But notice verse 7, he says, but there is not that knowledge in every man. So even though there are people who bow down to gods, there are people who bow down to lords, we know that there is only one God. He's Jehovah. There's only one Lord. This is the one that Peter said on the day of Pentecost. He said, this same Jesus whom you've crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. And so it means he's sovereign. It means he's got all authority. And he has that authority because God gave him that right. And he will rule with that authority until the end comes. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, Then come at the end, when he will deliver the kingdom back to God who gave it. So for now, Jesus has all authority. In his prayer to the Father prior to his imminent departure, Jesus said in John 17, he said, you have given me authority over all flesh. While there are many people who have not submitted unto him yet, there are people who have, and they recognize him as sovereign. But in this question, Jesus says, it's inconsistent for you to call me Lord and not do that I, what I say. And so I say this simply to introduce the lesson that we're going to discuss this morning, the question comes from a series of lessons about questions about God and about faith. And I need to pause and I want to acknowledge my gratitude to God. And I'm grateful to God because he is God, because of who he is, and because of what he has done. And not only that, because of what God continues to do. No, God is not dead. God is alive and he is on his throne. In fact, that should shape our worldview of things. And not only that, Jesus Christ is on his throne. And he reigns at the right hand of the Father and he reigns in the hearts of men and women who have submitted their will to him. And I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit, for the presence of God. And I'm grateful for the revelation of truth that God has left us with. And I'm grateful again for this wonderful fellowship that God has blessed us. You know, when the world think about fellowship, they think about food, fun, and frolic. But this fellowship, it's a spiritual fellowship. We sing, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. We're talking about the things that we do together in worship, in work. And I thank you for the kind invitation for Bessie and I to come and to worship and to work together with you in this special effort. I thank you, my brother, for singing, leading us in singing this morning, and for all of you, us, as we've joined our voices together in singing praises to our God and teaching and admonishing one another. Thank you, my brother, for leading us in those thoughts. I thought he was over there. I missed him. Thank you, my brother, for leading us in those thoughts as we prepared our hearts and our minds to remember Jesus and the sacrifice and his sufferings that he made at Calvary. May we never forget Calvary. And I must thank my brother Adam. I thank you for all the coordination, for your help. And I'm glad to count you not only as a brother, but a fellow gospel preacher. And I hear good things about you and the work that you do here. And I commend you. Finally able to put a name with the face. I'm grateful, my brother. And I'm grateful for all of you. Many of you who were here when Bessie and I came in September of 2009. There may be some new faces. 
and we are glad that you are here. We welcome you. For those of you who are visiting, we welcome you as well. I want you to know that we're just a group of people who belong to the Lord. We're just trying to do God's things in God's ways. God is the center of our worship. God is the center of our lives. And as was so very well expressed, we thank God for Jesus and what he has done and what he means to us. And so having said that, we're talking about questions about God and questions about faith. You know, the fact of the matter is that there are over 3,000 questions that are contained in the Bible. And I have... I have read that there are about a thousand of these that are in the New Testament. And the Lord himself used questions as a teaching instrument, both in instructing followers and, of course, as we've seen already, in answering his critics. And I think the passage that is under consideration, that is in Luke 6, verse 46, if we'll notice the context in which that was written, Luke's account is a parallel to the Sermon on the Mount, the book of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, which I, begin, which I believe begins actually in verse 20, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 20. If you compare that with the book of Matthew in chapter 5, 6, and 7, you can see the parallel there because this was a sermon that was preached before a great multitude, but it was addressed directly to his disciples. And near the end of Luke's account, we find this question that Jesus made that is, in fact, the basis of our study, where Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Now, the phrase calling upon the Lord has been misunderstood. I think we all know Romans in chapter 10, verse 13, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, of course, we know that there are a lot of people who take the Lord's name in vain. There are a lot of people who use the Lord's name sometimes simply as an exclamation point. And, you know, whenever we speak the Lord's name, whether we speak him as Lord or whether we acknowledge, indeed, who he is, the Lord Jesus Christ, let me tell you what, folks, we should always speak the Lord's name with reverence. Because he deserves that. Because of who he is and because of what he has done. And so, God wants us to call upon him. As a matter of fact, if I recall a passage in the Old Testament, in the 50th Psalm, I want you to turn over there and I want you to understand that I'm not just pulling this verse out of its context Look at Psalm number 50. Psalm 50 is speaking about God as the righteous judge, and he is. And God will judge righteously because God knows what is in the hearts of men. But God is also patient and long-suffering. And God doesn't want any to perish. But God wants us to understand some things. That there is a day that is appointed for all men to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And as we talked in our first lesson, we need to be prepared for that. And so what God says in this verse that I've chosen, God says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. I think we all know that there are people who take God for granted. I'm talking about people who treat God like a band-aid. I'm talking about people who only call upon God when they want something. I'm talking about people who call upon God when they hurt him, when they don't like where they are. But I think you and I know that one of the greatest blessings that God has given his children is the ability for us to be able to communicate with him. Remember that story in the book of Luke in chapter 18 where Jesus says that men ought always to pray and not faint or lose heart. And he talks about that in woman who comes before this judge. And this judge doesn't answer because he's a righteous judge. He says, lest she wears me out, I will answer her. And Jesus draws the point of the lesson. 
He says, shall not God answer his own who cry out to him day and night? Yes. Yes, he will. Well, why? Because the eyes of the Lord over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But his face is against those who do evil. And so Jesus asked the question, when a son of man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will he find that kind of faith? Like that woman who believed in God, believed in the power of prayer. And understands, as we ought to understand, that it's without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The Bible tells me that he that turneth his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer, is an abomination to God. Proverbs 28, verse 9. That there are people who call upon God and they have no desire to do what God wants. But God wants us to call upon him. God wants us to understand who he is. God wants us to understand what he has done. And if we understand that, folks, I tell you what, we will willingly come and bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and do whatever he tells us because of the mercy and the grace that is available to all of us. And again, because of what our brother said, because of the love of God, what I want to do is I want to look at three areas as I raise this question and answer it as well. As I raise this question, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I do regarding my word? Well, first of all, I want us to recognize that the word of God reveals to us the truth about creation. A lot of people in this world don't know where they came from, let alone what happens when you die. A lot of people don't even know why we are on this earth. But you know what the Bible reveals to us in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2? That God created the heavens and the earth. What the Bible tells me is that life came from God. What that also tells me is that man is a physical being. Yes, there is something about us like God. Because the Bible says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. Genesis 1, 26 and verse 27. In the image of God created he him. The Bible uses a figure of speech, anthropomorphism, that ascribes human qualities to deity. That helps us to understand that. Again, 1 Peter 3, 12. The eyes of the Lord over the righteous and his ears open to their prayers. I'm talking about the spiritual nature of man. I'm talking about the somebody that is in every last one of you. You see, because we are physical beings, we tend to think about the physical there more than we do the spiritual. But in every human being, there is a somebody in you because God is the one who created life. I believe this movement, A-L-B, All Lives Matter, don't the lives of innocent babies matter? Yes, because God created them. Don't the lives of older people matter? Yes, because God created them too. And God has given us instructions about life and where it comes from. When I read in the book of Genesis in chapter 1 and, uh, chapter one and 2, the Bible tells me that in six literal 24-hour days, that's where life comes from. We need to go back to the Bible. We need to go back to the Bible and see what God says about life and about creation and where it comes from. The psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firm matured forth his handiwork. Day unto day are the speech and night unto night there is no language where their voice is not heard. What that tells me is that there are two books that are open and so man is without excuse. We've got the book of nature that helps us to understand that all we have to do is look around and we can see the fingerprints of God all over creation. Look at the stars. Look at the sun. Look at the moon. How did they get there? Look at the plants, look at the trees, look at the flowers, look at human beings. And you see order in creation. And even the, the one who moves farther and far away from God and says that there is no God. You know why he's a fool? Because this universe is still here. 
Even though they may deny it, it's still here. How did it get here? God tells us why. God tells us how it got here. So why would you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say concerning the truth of creation? What about marriage and that it is, in fact, sacred? It is honorable. Marriage is honorable above all. And the wedding bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. God's word tells us that it is a union that is sanctified by God between two individuals, one being a male, the other one being a female. When those people came to Jesus in the book of Matthew in chapter 19, and the question was, can a man divorce his wife for any cause? Jesus says, have you not read? Here is the point of all of these lessons we're talking about in the series, folks. The question that we have can be answered by reading in God's word. I believe if we spent more time about marriage, there'd be less questions about divorce. I believe if we go back to the very beginning and if we see what God did in the beginning when he brought that man. After Adam had named all of the animals, the first thing we come to understand that wasn't good was that it was not good that man should be alone. And so God caused that man to go to sleep. He made a woman from the rib of Adam. And Adam woke up and he said, whoa, man. You got it. And God said, therefore she shall be called woman because she was taken from man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Have you not read, if they would have gone back, they would have understood that marriage is permanent. That God ordained marriage. And that marriage is between a man and a woman. And that those who are eligible to marry are those who have never been married. Or one whose mate has died. Or in the context of Matthew chapter 19, one who has put away his mate for the cause of fornication. And yet we see so much in this world today. Some want to apply such laws only to those who are in, quote, unquote, a covenant relationship with God already. And what kind of covenant relationship did Herod have when the Lord sent Herod, I mean, when the Lord sent John the Baptist in the book of Mark in chapter 14? John says, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herod had little regard and no regard for the Lord whatsoever, yet he was in violation of God's standard for marriage and standards that are imposed and binding upon all men. Many today, and even some of our own brethren, want to adopt a live and let live policy regarding marriage and relegate God's laws regarding it to ancient tribal customs or some such realm. And then there are others who want to open the floodgates and allow homosexual marriages. And that's basically a contradiction of terms. That's a misnomer. And sadly, many others, those who are calling and clamoring for such are likewise those who claim to be religious and make a pretense of following the Lord. I mean, how can anyone think that God approves of such? Homosexuality has taken the forefront. And you ask yourself, why? I'll tell you what, folks, there are many people who are taking advantage. Listen very carefully. Taking advantage of the marriage benefits without being married. While we talk so much about homosexuality, we should be talking about fornication. There are people who are living in fornication, and it's going to cost them their souls. I'm talking about being sexually intimate, and you're not in a lawful relationship. Souls are at stake. And how can a person be a legitimate follower of Jesus Christ while refusing to listen to the Lord on this basic marriage about the sanctity of marriage? Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Another thought regarding this matter. Let me tell you what, folks. 
I want to talk a little bit more about the sanctity of human life. You know why? Because in this world, God's word speaks to us directly that life comes from God. But another hot topic that has come to the forefront is abortion. And I know that these matters do indeed involve the moral and the biblical for the child of God. I got to say something. Hear me out, please. That the political side, we need to be aware of. Because there is a segment of the Lord's body who refuses to see that political candidates who uphold such immoral practices as abortion and homosexuality cannot be supported by those who believe and know the truth. Too many such members of the Lord's body, they vote and they lend their own influence and voices and support on the basis of a party's affiliation. And disregard entirely the candidate's stand or lack thereof regarding these very serious matters. Abortion is murder, plain and simple. And homosexuality is sinful. And it will cause one to spend an eternity in hell. And of these truths there can be no doubt. But how can one possibly claim to be a servant of the Lord? On the one hand, while pulling the voting lever in the other in support of one who upholds such ungodly practices as abortion and homosexuality with the other. And I know some folks say that we ought not intermingle religion and politics. But let me ask you, if faithful members of the Lord's body do not speak up and against such immoral practices as abortion and homosexuality, just who do you think will? Will the politicians do that? Why call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Babies are dying by the millions, and our voices are silent. God's word revealed to us the fact that he has given us everything we need for life. It's the perfect God. Any questions we have, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and it is a light unto my path. It is through God's word we get understanding. And when we get understanding, you know what, folks? We ought to hate every false way. It ought to produce an attitude within us to help us to understand how God thinks. What God's desire is and is for us. Of course, you recognize in the book of 1 Timothy in chapter 4 at verse 13. We can understand that in spite of all the philosophies that there are in this world, there has never been a greater need for the guidance that is provided by the word of God that in currently that exists in the world today. This word of God, which has been once for all delivered. This word of God that we ought to desire as a sincere miracle of the word. This word of God that has been given to us that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God. This word of God that we ought to love, to love the truth. This word of God that has been given to us. So we can prepare ourselves for eternity. All scripture has been given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God can be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all works. And even though there are other claims and other documents, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Christ, the Koran, the philosophies of men, and countless other books and teachings that are written, let me tell you what, the word of God ought to be the Christian's guide in his life. I think what that first of all tells me that I need to be a daily Bible reader. I need to know what's inside this book. I need to study it. And not only do I need to study it, I need to apply it. 
so that when questions do come up in life, I have the answers that are available to me. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? It doesn't matter what the hot topic might be. Greenhouse gases. This is not about conservation. This is about salvation. This is about sanctification. This is about holiness. And again, the word of God is what ought to shape our worldview. Not by what the media says, not by what politicians says, not by what's popular, not by what's favorable. Second of all, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say regarding my work? Now, I think a lot of people misunderstood, and there's been a controversy about the difference between worship and work, worship and service. Yes, there are things that we do when we come together, and I'll say a little bit more about that just shortly. But the Lord himself said that he had work to do. In John in chapter 4, the Father sent him to do work. And so if the Lord has work to do, then you and I have work to do as well. Jesus proclaimed that he was sent to work to do the will of the Father that sent him. And just prior to the cross, you know what he said again in that prayer in John 17? I have finished the work that you gave me to do. When he was suspended upon the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. There's a lot of people who confuse works. No, we don't work or earn our way into heaven, but there are works that we must do. People fail to understand what Ephesians in chapter 2 is talking about when the apostle Paul begins to unfold this mystery. He said we're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. We understand that. Not a worthless any man should boast. What Paul is basically saying is that there is God's part, but there is also our part. Because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So Jesus taught that those who follow him must also work. Remember in the book of Mark in chapter 13 at verse 34, Jesus spoke about a man in that parable going on a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. And he commanded the porter to watch. And so you know what the faithful child of God is going to do? He is going to always be abounding in the work of the Lord so that he can be ready when the Lord does return. He's going to recognize what the will of the Lord is. That's what Paul said. Be not unwise, but be wise, understanding the will of the Lord. And of course, as the apostle Paul spoke in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, his prayer for the Colossians was that they might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And one works, of course, while judgment is in view. And, of course, those who follow Jesus must understand that strict obedience to God is, in fact, essential. What that means, folks, is that we need to do God's work in God's way. We can't just go out and do whatever we want to do and claim that the Lord allows us to do these things. In fact, this is what separates many of our brethren. Let me give you an illustration. Institutionalism, for instance. What that means is churches supporting human institutions. Can I give you a solution to that? Because sometimes James 1.27 and Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 are used as proof texts. James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the orphans and the widows and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. If you understand the context of James, that's talking about an individual responsibility. If you look at Galatians chapter 6 verse 10, that's also talking about an individual responsibility. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. As we say we have opportunity. Let us do good unto all men. Let me show you an, an illustration where the difference between an individual responsibility and a collective responsibility is pointed out. Look in your Bibles in the book of 1 Timothy in chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verse 
And we're talking about work that we have to do. Look at verse 3. The Apostle Paul says, Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now what he says is, is that if your mothers have lost their mates, then we as a family have a responsibility towards our mother. That's a given, right? But there's a lot of people today who do not have time for their mothers who've lost their husbands. And I tell you, anniversaries come around, dates come around, and there's loneliness and there's pain. You visit nursing homes, health care facilities, and some of those people have been deserted. And Paul says we have a personal responsibility not to build human institutions to take care of them. And I know that those facilities may be necessary when health becomes to such a state that constant attention is required. But Paul says we have an individual responsibility. And look at verse 5. He says, now she who is a re really a widow and left alone, she trusts in God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But, anyone denies, but if anyone does not provide for his own house, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and he's worse than an infidel. Notice the next few verses. He offers the qualification for one to be supported collectively by the church. He says, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work, but refused the younger widows, he says. He says, I desire that the younger widows marry. But look at verse 16. He says, if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. I think that means that in any local congregation where I identify myself, part of the work that I have to do is to, number one, know who the widows are and to do whatever I can for them. When James says to visit the widows, I think that involves more than a personal social visit. The Bible tells me that the Lord visited his people. When Jesus came to this earth, he came here to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. And I believe that's what Paul is saying, that that's the attitude that we need to have towards widows. And you know what another good work is? Another good work is to look after those who are orphans. One translation says orphans. Another translation, and I believe that that's correct, says the fatherless. Do you know that there are a lot of children who are fatherless? The father may be present in the home, but he may not be active spiritually, like Timothy's father. The only thing that could be said about Timothy's father was that he was a Greek. But it took Lois and Eunice and their influence, like it does today where there are so many women who are actively involved in working to protect the souls of our children. And so what I'm saying is, men, we need to be busy, not only with our own children, but look around you in the local congregation where you are. And if you see children who are fatherless without a spiritual influence in their homes, you become a mentor to them. You become like a father to them, like Paul was to Timothy. There are many single mothers who are struggling. And they need some sort of male help. 
and raising these young men and young daughters to understand the kind of people that they ought to be. I got to tell you what, folks, there's a lot of work to do. And a lot of folks misunderstand the work that's involved. There is personal work. That is taking an active interest in people who have not yet obeyed the gospel. There may be people who visit the local congregation. There may be people you know on your jobs. There are people who are around you. And all I'm simply saying is that those who follow Jesus must do what he says. Be concerned about those who are less fortunate. Matthew chapter 25. Inasmuch as you've done this to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. Inasmuch as you've not done this. We need to be actively involved in the local work where we are. I believe the greatest challenge of any local congregation is for the elders who watch for souls to make sure that everyone is involved. Can I ask you individually, are you involved in the work here at Bumpney? If you've identified with this church, the second question is, what are you doing? I'm not talking about coming to church. That's worship. I'm talking about working. What are you doing? And if you don't know what you can do, just ask your elders, and I assure you, they'll put you to work. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? And then last but not least, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say regarding my worship? Now, regarding worship, we understand that worship must be in spirit and in truth. I think there are some things we need to understand about worship. Because the principles of worship have always been the same. Do you recall the patriarchal dispensation when God spoke directly to man? When people worship on altars. Can I use Abel as an example? Abel offered a more sacrifice by faith. Abel's offering was accepted, but his brother Cain was not. Well, why? Well, you and I know that there are people like Cain. They offer things to God, but God doesn't accept it. You know what the point of that is? The point of that is, is that worship can be vain. We could offer something to God, and God doesn't accept it. It must be in spirit and in truth. Whatever it was that God said to Cain and Abel, you know what? Abel respected God for who he was, and Abel offered by faith whatever it was that God told him. There was a time, of course, when Israel worshipped God under the Mosaical dispensation. Remember, God met with Israel at Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. God gave them the law. And again, that theocracy. God regulated their civil affairs. God regulated their religious life. God regulated their home affairs. Over 600 laws and statutes and commandments and, and ordinances. And that law was never given to us. In the book of Leviticus itself, I mean, when you read that, those are instructions for the priests and how they were to conduct their services and how they were to teach the people about what they were supposed to do. Remember, in first of all, the tabernacle that they built and then later the temple. But you recall from where that statement came in John in chapter 4, Jesus says that worship was not going to be restricted to a place. Here were the principles of worship, folks. Number one, God is to be worshipped, and only God. And God is to be worshipped in the way in which he has directed us. Do you know what's the problem with the religious world today? People who are calling Jesus Lord, Lord, they are offering worship that is not acceptable. For us to offer worship to God that is acceptable, we must go to God's word so we can know what is acceptable to God. We have Bible examples of what is authorized as far as worship when we come together. This is an understanding of this word fellowship. If I might take 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, The bread which we break, is it not the fellowship, the koinonia, 
That Greek word koinonia, it means fellowship. It means a sharing, a joint participation. There are things that we do when we come together. And what that speaks to me of is the assembling aspect of our relationship. That's the church. The ecclesia. When we come together, there are specific things that we do. Our relationship with God is spoken of as a family, right? Because God is our father. The family is the togetherness aspect of the relationship. The apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14, he says, I bow my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereupon the whole family of heaven and earth is named. The family conveys to our mind the fact that we are together. The together, your family, you spend time together, right? We spend time together in worship, things that we do outside of the building. That's the togetherness aspect. We are the family of God wherever we are, you see. When the Bible talks about the body, the body is the unity aspect of that relationship. 1 Corinthians 12. Romans chapter 12, your body has different members. Those different parts of your body, they all function together, right? Well, that's the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. Different members involved doing things. And remember, Colossians 1.18, Jesus is the head of the body, the church, the beginning. The firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. Look up that word preeminence. He has the first place of honor. Why? Because he's the head. Because he's the Lord. The body conveys to us that Bible type, the temple. Because we priests, we offer worship to God. The Bible simply helps us to understand our relationship with God. But I want to get back to the church because the church is what confuses a lot of people. A lot of people think that we could do anything when we come to church. That we can use instruments of music. And they try to justify that because they use instruments of music in the Old Testament. And yes, they did. But they also offered incense. And they also offered animal sacrifices. And I'm simply saying that if Jesus is Lord, I must recognize what the Lord tells me to do if I am to offer worship to him. I understand what is worship by looking in the scriptures. For instance, when I look in the book of Acts in chapter 20, verse 7, you know what the Bible tells me? On the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. And Paul preached to them. So I know it's on the first day of the week. That's the reason why disciples come together, so that they can break bread as we have done this morning, so that we can remember Jesus and what he did at Calvary. And that's consistent, of course, with 1 Corinthians chapter 16. On the first day of the week, he says, let every one of you lay by in store. So that tells me that there are two items of worship that are consistent on the first day of the week. That is the communion and that is the contribution. Those are the only days, and yet you see in the religious world, that people pick up so-called contributions, love offerings, and people even serve the communion various days of the week. And don't even understand. Do you understand the simple instructions that the Lord gave us concerning the Lord's Supper has caused so much division in the religious world? The doctrine of transubstantiation. The teaching of a third element in addition to the body and the blood of Jesus, the cup as well. When people simply fail to understand that Jesus died. And Jesus left us instructions on how he wants to be remembered. And so there's singing and there's praying. And we find Bible examples of what the church did in the New Testament after Jesus died upon the cross. And so he left these instructions. And he gave them to the apostles. And they're recorded in God's word. And so we have God's word. Can I say this as I close this lesson? The Lord reigns. The Lord is still on his throne. I mean, whether we submit to him or not. He still rules in the hearts of those who've submitted to him. He still has authority over all flesh. 
But the benefit of all of this is if we open up our hearts and listen to what God says, we can learn how to properly worship God. Our worship would be acceptable. We can encourage one another in the process while we do so. But you know what? We can also help and teach others who don't understand these principles and help them to understand it's not enough to be religious. But you have to be right. If you call Jesus Lord, you need to recognize what Jesus says, what Jesus teaches. And you need to make up your mind that you're going to simply do what he says. It certainly would not be right to close this lesson without extending the Lord's invitation. If you haven't already, there's an article in the bulletin about what must I do to be saved. We've been talking about questions about God and faith. Here is a question, what must I do to be saved? There is a simple answer to that. But you'll find various answers throughout the religious world. God has spoken to us specifically about the issue of salvation. And that is a person needs to hear. They need to be taught what God wants them to know and to do in order to be saved. And they need to believe that. And quite simply, they just need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That God sent his son, John 3, 16. The father sent the son to be the savior of the world. If you believe that, that Jesus is the Christ, and you are willing to repent, turn from sin and turn to Jesus Christ, if you're willing to confess him, if you agree with what God says, you're willing to confess Jesus Christ, and you're willing to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, let me tell you what. That's the right answer, and that's the right response to what an individual needs to do in order to be saved. And you no longer need to live in confusion anymore. And further questions you have can certainly be answered. Because you have a new family. You have a new Savior. You have a new hope. You have a new direction. You have a new life. You have a new destiny. Everything will become new. But the decision is yours to make. And if you are a Christian and you've acknowledged that Jesus is Lord, but you know you haven't been living and doing all the things that God wants you to, then make the decision today to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. Allow him to reign in your heart and in your life. And allow your influence to spread so you can help others to see that Jesus is Lord. He is. Let him rule over you. Let this song encourage you while together we stand and sing.